trial. But even before that trial starts, Donald Trump is already dealing with a serious setback. State Supreme Court Justice Arthur Engeron found him liable for fraudulently overvaluing his assets by as much as $2.2 billion, stripping him of control of some of his key New York properties, including Trump Tower in Midtown Manhattan. This trial will determine what other price he's going to have to pay. And in the next couple of weeks, Trump is also expected to sit for sworn depositions in two separate civil cases. My next guest is here to break it all down. Joining me now is Glenn Kirshner, MSNBC legal analyst, former federal prosecutor, and the host of the Justice Matters podcast. Glenn, my friend, always a lot to break down. Let's start with those depots. So on October 9th in New York, Michael Cohen, who you and I both know, knows where all the bodies are buried, knows exactly how Trump ticks. He's going to be able to depose Donald Trump in a civil suit that Trump brought against him in my state of Florida for $500 million, as absurd as that is. And then on October 17th, Peter Strzok is able to depose Donald Trump in Florida for a lawsuit that was brought as well against uh, the Department of Justice and the federal government by Peter Strzok. So, Listen, Glenn, these are sworn depositions. Do you anticipate him, as in Trump, taking the fifth at all, or do you think he's just going to give some type of BS testimony? Yeah, good morning, Katie. And perhaps the understatement of the morning is that when Donald Trump is placed under oath and begins testifying, he ordinarily doesn't do himself any favors. So I, I can't imagine his lawyers would urge him to testify. They would probably urge him to plead the fifth, you know, we all saw the results, uh, the train wreck that was Donald Trump's deposition in the E. Jean Carroll case when he actually said things that were a frontal assault on his own legal position. And, you know, that is one of the many reasons he went down in flames. You know, E. Jean Carroll really mopped the floor with him, figuratively speaking, in that litigation. And then what does Donald Trump do after he loses? The case brought against him by E. Jean Carroll, he goes out and lies and defames her again, for which he will again likely be held accountable. So it's really hard to, to fathom how his lawyers would say, you know what, go ahead and testify, Mr. Trump, because he will only dig his own legal hole deeper and deeper. Glenn, let's go uh, down the road a little bit from here in Florida. Let's go to Fort Pierce, where Judge Aileen Cannon presides in the court, the federal courthouse up there, October 12th, in between those two depots you and I just talked about, is going to be a Garcia hearing, two Garcia hearings, in the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. Now, it doesn't involve Trump and his lawyers. It involves his co-defendants, Walt Nauta and Carlos de Oliveira, and their lawyers. But why should Donald Trump be nervous if there does end up being a finding that there is a conflict of interest and maybe Maybe those two co-defendants get new lawyers. Because any time that a witness who has incriminating information about Donald Trump gets a conflict-free lawyer, as every witness is entitled to under the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel, it's a really bad thing for Donald Trump. We've seen how when MAGA world lawyers represent adverse witnesses, witnesses who could incriminate Donald Trump, whether it's Cassidy Hutchinson or Yusil Tavares, the former IT director down at Mar-a-Lago, when they get conflict-free counsel, the truth starts tumbling out, and they start to incriminate Donald Trump and others. So a Garcia hearing, as you say, is a hearing to decide whether other witnesses or co-defendants are entitled to conflict-free counsel. Of course, the Constitution says they are. And if they get conflict-free counsel, Again, it spells more trouble because they will likely incriminate Donald Trump and perhaps others. And then in your backyard, Glenn, let's go there last. Let's talk about Judge Tanya Chuckin, the 1-6 election interference case against Donald Trump that's up in D.C. You and I, when we were in law school and thereafter, were taught always read the footnotes. And in the most recent DOJ filing that just came out on Friday in support of a gag order against Donald Trump, there's a really damning footnote about Donald Trump's alleged non-purchase or non-possession of a firearm that would have not only been in violation of federal law, but also in his conditions of release. Do you think Judge Chuckin is going to check out the footnotes like you and I would? Oh, she'll read that pleading several times over, and I look forward to attending the hearing that she has now set on October 16th on special counsel Jack Smith's request, not for a gag order, but for a, a narrowly tailored restriction 
on Donald Trump's mm -hmm. speech and Donald Trump's posts to protect the witnesses, to protect the judges and the prosecutors and the jurors, and to give we the people a shot at a fair trial, because Donald Trump is forever attempting to poison all future jury pools. So I think Donald Trump's time of being able to run his mouth and post on his third-rate social media platform unencumbered is about to end. I think you're going to see Judge Chuck in issue a narrowly tailored restriction on Donald Trump's speech. And then, Katie, how soon before Donald Trump violates the restrictions that uh, Judge Chutkin imposes, and then we will all uh, be anxious to see what kind of sanctions might be imposed for those violations. I'm going to push back for a second, and I'm going to take the popular opinion that's only popular probably in Truth Social and in Trump world. What's the harm of letting him run his mouth? and letting him post the stupidity that he does. I acknowledge that there is violence afoot, and I do know that people do violent actions at the behest of Donald Trump. But as you have always well pointed out, Glenn, the guy does himself in, whether it's sworn deposition testimony, whether it's truth social, whether it's interviews, whether it's rallies. I mean, doesn't it, he was never gonna get a sympathetic G, a DC jury poll anyway. So if she doesn't, if Judge Chuckin doesn't enter that limited gag order, that limited narrow you know, ability for him to do it, What's the harm? The harm is it endangers witnesses in the most extreme way imaginable. We all saw, saw that horrific post by Donald Trump falsely claiming that General Mark Milley had engaged in treason and urging that he should be executed. And, you know, that was not lost on Jack Smith and company, because here's one sentence from the new uh, pleading that they just filed mm -hmm. in their quest to convince Judge Chutkin to issue uh, a gag order. In essence, they say no other criminal defendant would be permitted to issue public statements insinuating that a known witness in this case should be executed. This defendant, Donald Trump, should not be permitted either. The stakes are too high when you have somebody as reckless and dangerous as Donald Trump sending out a not-so-subtle subtle call to his most reckless supporters that these are the enemies, the General Millies and any other witness who seeks to hold me accountable for my crimes. Therefore, you know what to do. You did it on January 6th, and I'm counting on you to do it again. That is the harm here by doing nothing. Let me be clear. I fully support the entry of this order, just like I predict he would violate it and you'd have a contempt evidentiary hearing and maybe he'll go to jail. Glenn Kirshner, you're always so good. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Still to come, although new polling may give GOP 2024 candidate Nikki Haley some hopes for success, is the former South Carolina governor truly ready, willing, and able to take on Trump for that top spot? Or will Haley's comet crash and burn? You're watching... So when you consider the Republican candidates that are angling for the White House, the prospects are bleak for the GOP. And now you may think that former Ambassador Nikki Haley may seem like a decent option as compared to the former insurrectionist president or a former vice president who can't do much without a mother may I, or a Florida autocratic governor who has beef with a cartoon mouse. But is Nikki Haley really that much better? Roll the tape. Would a, if a six-week ban theoretically came to your desk, would you sign it? But why, why, I will answer that when you answer, when you ask Kamala and Biden if they would agree to 37 weeks, 38 weeks, 39 weeks. Then I'll answer your question. How do you define woke? There's a lot of things. I mean, you want to start with biological boys playing in girls' sports. That's one thing. The fact that we have gender pronoun classes in the military now. I mean, all of these things that are pushing what a small minority want on the majority of Americans, it's too much. She's just going to walk herself off that stage at that rate. Joining me now, Tara Setmeyer, senior advisor to the Lincoln Project and former comms director for the GOP, Tara. Just because Nikki Haley seems like the least extreme, although that uh, tape would prove otherwise, right, the least extreme of her opponents, it doesn't mean that she's good for America. So let's go through something really quickly before I get to you. Abortion. She's strongly pro-life. She's supportive of states being able to do a ban. She wants to criminalize abortions, and she'll sign a nationwide ban if she's in the Oval. Grocery Climate. Prices. She's acknowledged seven.
she's acknowledged climate change is real, but she'll reverse Biden's climate protections, including withdrawing from the Paris Agreement and eliminating subsidies for renewable energy. She doesn't support financial aid to Ukraine. For immigration, she's going to start catch and deport, and she wants to limit birthright citizenship. With Trump, she's inclined to pardon him, and she supports an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. She says transgender rights are a threat to women, that sex is binary, and she bans the use of public funds for transition care, and she calls herself a union buster. Tara, she does not seem like she's a better option for America in any way. Well, it's clear that Nikki Haley's trying to be everything to everyone all at once, right? She takes both sides of every position uh, for Republicans. This is not a, a general election strategy for the most part. She has to get through the primary first. Uh, some of her positions, she's trying to make herself more palatable to a national audience the way she spoke about abortion, um, to make it seem as though, well, we don't have enough votes in the Senate, and as women, we need to, you, you know, we shouldn't punish women for, you know. She tries to, to put in there some moderating language. But you went through the list of issues here, and she's very conservative mm -hmm. on most of them, more conservative than the majority of the country. Is she better than Donald Trump? Well, yeah. I mean, almost anyone is better than Donald Trump. My cat Tiki would be better than Donald Trump. The guy's an authoritarian dictator wannabe who wants to tear up our Constitution. So um, that's a very low bar to say, is she better than Trump? But you have to get past the Republican primary first. And a lot of us who thought that Nikki Haley, I mean, I was a Republican for 27 years, and she was an up-and-comer, and she was someone that we looked to and said, okay, she's got potential for a larger office. We like what she did in South Carolina, standing up to the racist, taking down the, the flag of treason, as we call it at the Lincoln Project, the Confederate flag. Those were bold moves in South Carolina. But then when it politically was advantageous to her in her mind, she completely took the other side when she needed to, a.k.a., becoming Donald Trump's U.N. ambassador. So you can't trust her. Will the real Nikki Haley please stand up? I don't think we really know who that is. Does she? And to your point, I'm glad that you brought it up, Tara, because Haley initially actually endorsed Marco Rubio. Mark, Lil Marco. I was there. In 2016. I was there okay. in South Carolina she at the told... primary when she did that. And she told Marco Rubio, I'm going to do whatever it takes to help you beat Donald Trump, including publicly berating Trump. But when Rubio lost, she then supported Ted Cruz. We can't account for taste, right? Then she votes for Trump, <laughs> joining his administration, even after he publicly bullied her. There's a Democratic strategist in South Carolina who said, quote, she, as a Nikki Haley, will adapt to whatever benefits her to whoever she's around. So isn't that Tara, to your point, just a nice way of saying that she's two-faced and she'll do and say what it takes to get people to like her? Absolutely. Uh, we've seen this. She's done it time and time again. She tries to package it a little bit nicer. Uh, her strategists are trying to, they know that this is an issue, so they're trying to turn this around now and use it as uh, a badge of valor. Well, she knows how to work both sides. That means that she's able to look at both sides of an issue and come to, uh, you know, a good bipartisan agreement or, you know, find middle ground. Nice try, but we all see and hear what Nikki Haley has said and done. Let's not forget that she also raised her hand and said that she would support Donald Trump if he were the nominee, and that she would pa pardon him. So which is it? This is a time for choosing. We're not talking about both sides of how you feel about marginal tax rates or health care policy. We're talking about whether you're supporting someone who wants to destroy our Constitution and destroy our democratic republic. That's what we're talking about here. These are very serious issues. There is no both sides of authoritarianism here that you can take which she is, she's trying to do here, playing both sides in order to get through the primary. So, you know, for Nikki Haley, it is a time for choosing. You need to choose whether it's America and our democracy, or you're going to continue to bow to Trumpism, which will destroy us. You can't have it both ways. And that's the most frustrating part about her. Playing both sides of this is partially normalizing what Donald Trump has done to this country and to the Republican and to the Republican Party. And it's people like her, the enablers like her, that have allowed us to get to this point in the first place. So I we as Americans, we should reject that. You either take a position against authoritarianism and pro-democracy, or you're unqualified to hold the highest office in the land. Full stop. Tara Setmeyer. I tweeted this out, whatever, exit out, whatever they call it. <laughs> Straight truth telling, it always comes for Tara Setmeyer. Thank you for joining us for our latest installment of I'm Just Not That Into You Either, where we highlight how bad the other GOP candidates are. Tara, it's always good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you.
Coming up next, from the news to cover and lots of questions to answer, so let's get started. Back from the brink, Democrats bail out House Speaker Kevin McCarthy from the radical Republicans who were intent on shutting down the government. I want to know if this 45-day deal to keep the federal government funded is just a temporary Band-Aid for an unfixable wound. Representative Becca Ballant is standing by with her thoughts. Plus, Must See TV will get to watch one of the four criminal trials of the most indicted former U.S. president in history play out on TV and the Internet. But before Trump is ready for his close-up, he could be on the witness stand and the New York Attorney General's $250 million fraud trial starting tomorrow. MSNBC legal analyst Glenn Kirshner is also standing by to break down all of the developments like only he can. And later, from jail to Yale, how a higher education partnership is revolutionizing rehabilitation behind bars. All of that and more is coming up. And a good Sunday morning to you all. I'm Katie Fang. We start today's show with a down-to-the-wire close call. A full-blown government shutdown crisis is narrowly averted for now. In a major plot twist that would rival a Hollywood blockbuster, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy was somehow able to shake off the radical Republican Freedom Caucus demands and push forward a vote on a clean 45-day short-term funding bill. That bill passing thanks in large part to 209 Democrats bailing McCarthy out and voting in favor of it. And with just three hours to spare, the Senate would pass that House bill with a vote of 88 to 9. Overnight, President Biden signed it into law just moments before that dire midnight deadline. But McCarthy's House of Cards is teetering towards collapse. Here's what the House Speaker had to say when confronted with the strong possibility that he's staring down a motion to vacate after the bipartisan vote. If somebody wants to make a motion against me, bring it. There has to be an adult in the room. I am going to govern which what is best for this country. I don't understand how long will it take to you understand that. I went 15 rounds. It took 15 rounds for McCarthy to become speaker, but maybe it's just one thwarted government shutdown to knock him out. We'll see what Monday brings when the House returns. Joining me now, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Julie Serkin. Julie, good morning. 45 days seems like it's a long enough timeline to hammer out a long-term deal, but not much may change over the next six weeks. So what's the level of optimism about productive talks moving forward and that you're hearing there on the Hill? Well, yeah, you're exactly right. They have a lot of work to get done, especially when it comes to approving those individual appropriation bills, because remember, that's how this process is really supposed to work. The House and the Senate are supposed to each pass 12 appropriation bills that touch every corner of the government uh, and then coalesce in what's called a conference to see if they can hammer out differences uh, and ultimately fund the government for an entire year. That's not what's been happening over the last few years as the political polarization has rifled through this chamber. They've instead been jamming everything at the last second. Uh, members can't read the bills. That's part of the problems here. And from McCarthy's part, he really did back off and buck off those conservatives to get to this place yesterday. But he did so, as you said, rightly said, with the motion to vacate looming over him. And we know that Congressman Matt Gates, from my conversations with him yesterday, he's having those conversations and it would only take one person to trigger that vote. From McCarthy's part, though, he's not worried about that at the moment. Here's what he had to say yesterday in terms of this bipartisan showing. Would I have wanted the bill we put on the floor yesterday that would secure our border, cut wasteful spending? Yes, I did. But I had some members in our own conference that wouldn't vote for that. So if you have members in your conference that won't let you vote for appropriation bills, doesn't want an omnibus, and won't vote for a stopgap measure, so the only answer is to shut down and not pay our troops, I don't want to be a part of that team. I want to be a part of a conservative group that wants to get things done. Katie, we narrowly avoided this shutdown this time. A total surprise, not only to us, but to members of Congress, including Democrats, who were rushing to read the 70-page clean continuing resolution. The problem now, though, is, of course, that bill did not include any funding for Ukraine. You heard from McCarthy. Conservatives want to see the border addressed. Congress hasn't been able to come around a bipartisan solution on that in three decades. And, of course, President Biden can't do that much on the border without congressional action. So the next steps here 
year, in addition to funding the government for a full year, would be that supplemental for Ukraine funding and the border as well. That'll be the next big fight that I'll be watching. Julie Serkin, thanks for getting us started. As always, it's good to see you. So let's bring in somebody who was in the thick of it yesterday, Democratic Congresswoman from Vermont, Becca Ballant, who is a member of the House Budget Committee. Congresswoman, we just heard from Julie Serkin. There was kind of a rush to see what was going on with that 70-page clean continuing resolution. Some concerns among Democrats as well, that there might be some nasty surprises in there. Did you encounter any when you read it? And how did you eventually come to decide to support Speaker McCarthy's bill? So... As you said, there was concern that there might be some poison pills in there. The reason why we thought that is because that's what we've been dealing with for months now. There's always poison pills attached. So it was this very surreal moment when you had the extremists and McCarthy saying, well, you need to trust us. You need to trust us. You don't need to read it. And uh, we had our whip asking for time for us to, to read the bill that was denied. So we used some parliamentary procedures so that we could read it. And yes, there were just a few uh, minor changes uh, from, from my perspective. The most important thing that I was looking at was the funding for FEMA and disaster relief. Vermont is still very much suffering from our catastrophic flooding this summer. Now, obviously, the re Ukraine funding is an issue, but the reason why I felt comfortable voting for this was because we had a very, very strong bipartisan vote in support of Ukraine funding. And so I believe there's another way that we can get uh, that support to Ukraine through. Uh, but it certainly was a Saturday surprise when, when I woke up yesterday morning, I felt certain that we were heading to shut down because McCarthy has not been willing to stand up to the extremists thus far. And so this was really a victory against the, the folks in Congress who actually don't stand for anything except themselves. And uh, it shouldn't have gotten to the 11th hour, but I'm so pleased that we were able to get funding for 45 days. And as you said, that's not a long time, but maybe, just maybe, the fever has broken for some of the so-called moderates within the Republican conference. It's a math problem. You can't pass these bills without Democrats. You can't. Yeah, but Congresswoman, to your point, though, 45 days sounds like it's going to be enough time. We all know in reality it's not going to be. You've got a chaos caucus that's going on. They may have, you know, been overruled with saner, more calm, more rational voices in the room yesterday, as McCarthy said, an adult in the room. But what is your optimism in terms of being able to productively get something done within those 45 days? I mean, we're going to be kissing Thanksgiving, the eve of Thanksgiving, by the time that 45 days is up. Yes, that is absolutely concerning. But I just want to go back to McCarthy saying he's going to be the adult in the room. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. This is a man who gave away the store, who made promise after promise after promise to the extremists. He set up this dynamic. And so for him to come out and say he's going to be the adult in the room is rich when he's got Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and others leading him by the nose. And so it is crucially important that the folks who truly ran to govern stand up and band together. That is the only way to get these appropriations bills through. I've got less than a minute, but I did want to ask you, let's talk about something that's probably not going to be surprising, and that's going to be a motion to vacate that's probably going to be facing uh, Kevin McCarthy when the House returns to session next. Do you think McCarthy could get some support from across the aisle from the Dem side of the world to keep his job? You know, that is certainly something that is uh, very much a topic of discussion within our mm -hmm. caucus. Look, this is a man who promised that he would not even entertain uh, an impeachment inquiry into the president until after we funded the government. That didn't happen. This is a man who said he was going to stick to the agreements that we made back in June on the, the default measure, the measure that we were able to come together on to avoid a catastrophic default. He has backtracked on every single promise that he has made to us. So he is not a partner that we can trust. That being said, if there is not another candidate that arises, Certainly, we'll look at some kind of power sharing agreement. We will consider that. But in terms of this being a partner that we are we we feel confidence in, that just is not the case. So we'll just have to see how the next few weeks unfold. Maybe that old adage gets tested. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Congresswoman Becca Ballant, my thanks to you for getting us started this morning. It's always good to see you. Thank you, Katie. Have a good one. And
You too. And when we come back, crisis averted for now. Florida Democratic Congressman Jared Moskowitz on how House Dems saved the nation from the radical Republican-led shutdown and his thoughts on the circus sideshow that is just embarrassing the GOP. You're watching the Katie News. That's plenty of time for House Republicans to cause more chaos on Capitol Hill. Far-right Chaos Caucus members continue to wield their power over House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, and they aren't ruling out ousting him, even after he caved to their demands to launch a baseless impeachment inquiry against President Joe Biden. And the House Republicans' first impeachment hearing on Thursday went about as poorly as you would expect. So-called expert witnesses for the GOP said there's simply no evidence to prove the flimsy allegations against what radical Republicans are calling the, quote, Biden crime family. My next guest was there at the impeachment hearing, and he said it's all a bluff. We're here because of meth. That's what this is about. They can't save Donald Trump. They can't take away the two impeachments and the four indictments, but they can try to put some numbers on the board for Joe Biden. But the problem is when you sling mud, you got to have mud. If you all think there's so much evidence, we're here, call the vote on impeachment. Impeach him right now. I dare you. Joining me now is Florida Congressman Jared Moskowitz. Jared, a little Katie Porter channeling going on there with that whiteboard. Very impressive. Um, look, we know that there was this last-ditch effort. It worked to stave off a full-scale government shutdown. I'm really interested, as I am a fellow Floridian with you, that $16 billion in disaster relief. You just heard Becca Ballant at the beginning of the show talking about how important that was for her state in Vermont because of the recent flooding. So that managed to make it through. So talk about that, please. Well, thanks, Katie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, that was a must for me. I had, you know, let uh, my friends across the aisle know that that was an absolute must. I had traveled actually to Hawaii with Speaker McCarthy uh, to view that damage, since I'm a, the only former emergency management director uh, in all of Congress. Uh, and so, yeah, that was hugely important. It was hugely important for Florida, for Vermont, for the fires in Hawaii, and for the future disasters that haven't yet happened. We're still in hurricane season. It's why I filed that standalone bill two months ago when FEMA said that the disaster recovery fund was going to run out of money. The idea that cities, counties, states would not be able to get the reimbursement money for response recovery, the idea that individuals would not get that individual assistance dollars because the U.S. government did not fund FEMA correctly. FEMA is the agency that helps people in its time of need, and it's a bipartisan agency because disasters don't care what party you belong to. And so that was a must for me. I'm glad we passed that on a bipartisan basis. Yeah, and Congressman, I did want to shift gears to what is being called, and by the way, I'm going to use Republicans' actual words now, the clown show, disgraceful and pathetic, and then I'm going to use your phrase, political impeachment malpractice hearing that happened a few days ago on Thursday. What new lows do you expect Chairman Comer and others to kind of pull off going from here? Well, first of all, who holds an impeachment hearing when you have no evidence on the guy you want to impeach? I mean, look, they've been working on this for the last eight or nine months. This wasn't the first hearing. They've had like six or seven of these. So now they decide to open, to rebrand it, to hit the video game reset button and go with impeachment inquiry. Okay, fine. So they hold this impeachment inquiry and they don't come with a new single piece of evidence. They, they just presented the same stuff they're presenting for eight or nine months. So the idea that we wouldn't be prepared on how to handle that, since we know it all, we know what they were going to say, uh, is ludicrous. By the way, they called a witness, Professor Turley, who they call all the time. What does mm -hmm. he say in his opening statement in the first two minutes of the hearing? He says, with everything we know at this juncture, every shred of evidence they've presented, every accusation they have made, everything they have put on social media and Fox News, with all of that said, here's what we know. It doesn't rise to the level of impeachment on Joe Biden. Right out of the gate, he says, you don't have the goods. And so, look, this is all about Hunter. They want to go after Hunter, the sins of the sun. They want to put that on. Uh, onto Joe, but that's not what high crimes and misdemeanors are uh, uh, in this country. And so, yeah, look, it was a clown show for them. It was an absolute utter disaster, which is actually why I'm glad they funded FEMA, because they're going to need FEMA's help to bail them out of the impeachment disaster uh, that they created for themselves. It wouldn't surprise me if Comer doesn't have another impeachment hearing for some time.
So, Jared, I got less than a minute, but I did want to ask, as a lawyer, I, my currency is evidence, and you just said there was no evidence. I was curious about this. Why won't the committee, Republicans, allow you guys to subpoena Rudy Giuliani and Lev Parnas, the people that were actually trafficking in the lies that have been debunked by now? I know that you guys wanted to subpoena them to appear to account for those lies. Why are the Republicans standing in the way? Oh, listen, they're never going to let us, you know, control the hearing, obviously, uh, except they forget that we get 50 percent of the time. I mean, that was they, they forgot, like, if we conduct an impeachment inquiry, the Democrats are going to get 50 percent of the time. Like, somehow they forgot that. But this is all they've gotten their instructions down from Donald Trump from Truth Social, right? He's got two impeachments. He's got four indictments. He's got half of the impeachments in American history, and he is 100 percent of the indictments in American history for a president. And so he's told them, you guys got to muddy up Joe Biden because I don't want to be the only guy with all of this stuff. And so that's what they're doing here. But yeah, look, they're not going to let us call the witnesses that got them into this mess. You know, they're not going to let us call Jared Kushner, who, by the way, got $2 billion from a foreign government when he worked in the West Wing. So no, they're not going to let us do that. But we're going to point that hypocrisy out which is why they have no credibility other than just trying to please Donald Trump so they can be invited to the sleepover at Mar-a-Lago. Oh, Congressman Jared Moskowitz, always bringing the fire. Appreciate you being here. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Coming up next, damage assessment. Donald Trump heads to New York City tonight ahead of tomorrow's civil fraud trial where the New York AG, Letitia James, seeks up to $250 million plus in damages. Fan favorite, friend of the show, Glenn Kirshner, joins me after the break on Trump's no good, really very bad legal week ahead. You're watching The Katie Fang Show, only on MSNBC.